You know, it's funny because people have been playing jokes on each other for as long as I can remember in this day called April Fool's Day. It's been celebrated for centuries, but nobody knows exactly the origin of it. Some think that it's because of when they changed the, France changed the calendar from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. That calendar, that was back in 1582. What would end up happening is that they would, uh, some people were slow to get the information. Some people didn't like change, <laughs> which maybe some of you guys, how many of you guys don't like change? There's a few that don't like change. They would, uh, those who didn't like change and those who didn't get the information, they were really slow to change this. So they kind of became the brunt of everybody's jokes. They were the, the target of their jokes and their hoaxes. So April Fools began to spread throughout Britain during the 18th century. In Scotland, the tradition became known as hunting the gawk, G O W. K. And Gawk was another name for the cuckoo bird. So, <laughs> thus the fool or the symbol of the fool. And what would happen then is people would send other folks on phony errands. And then that was followed up by something called Taily Day. And that involved pinning tails on people and putting kick me signs on the back sides, <laughs> right? So it kind of had all of its uh, evolution, if you will. Now, in modern times, people have gone to great lengths to create elaborate April Fool's hoaxes. Newspapers, radio, TV stations, websites, they've all participated in the April Fool tradition or the April 1st tradition, making some really fictional and outrageous claims. One of those is in 1957, you can go ahead and pop that up there. In 1957, the BBC reported that Swiss farmers were experiencing a record spaghetti crop <laughs> and they showed footage of people harvesting noodles from trees. People were calling in asking for how to get a tree. I'm serious. People were wanting to know how they could get a tree. I mean, think about it. If you thought spaghetti grew on trees, wouldn't you want a tree? I, I definitely would. Or pizza. Better than that, pizza. That would be nice. 1985, Sports Illustrated tricked many people, most of its readers actually, when they ran a, an article that basically said they had discovered a rookie picture, uh, pitcher excuse me, named Sid Finch that could throw a fastball at over 168 miles an hour. Supposedly, that's Sid Finch. But people bought it. People were like, this is going to end baseball as we know it because nobody will be able to hit this guy, not at 168 miles an hour. In 1996, Taco Bell duped people when they announced that it had agreed to purchase the Philadelphia's Liberty Bell. <laughs> I'm serious. They ran this article that they were going to buy it and rename it the Taco Liberty Bell. <laughs> and as you might imagine, there were people calling in irate. How can you possibly do this? Of course, they didn't know anything about it. In 1998, Burger King came out with a left-handed Whopper. <laughs> you laugh, but people came in and ordered it. People are pretty gullible. Back in high school, I had a friend that wasn't very mechanical. He was having some trouble with his car, so a buddy and I went over to, to help him, and uh, so we told him we needed to go to the auto parts store, and we convinced him that he needed to go into this auto parts store and ask for a water-cooled muffler bearing. Some of you are going, is that? No, it's not. There's, there's no such thing, but he went. <laughs> 
he was pretty mad when he came back out. <laughs> Here's some famous quotes about fools. Now, this is by George W. Bush. George W. Bush was pretty well known for mixing up his words, his illustrations, and his metaphors, right? So he, he said this. He goes, there's an old saying in Tennessee. He goes, I know it's, it's in Texas, but probably in Tennessee. And it says, fool me once, shame on you. Shame on you. Fool me, you can't get fooled again. I think he had a song mixed up with the quote. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. You can fool all of the people some of the time, and some of the people all of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. And I'm not so sure about that. Winston Churchill. The greatest lesson in life is to know that even fools are right sometimes. George R. Martin. He said, the greatest fools are oftentimes more clever than the men who laugh at them. Kierkegaard wrote this. He says, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to believe what is true. Where do you stand this morning? What do you believe? What makes you tick? What drives you? Brother Andrew said, I'm a fool, but I'm a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you? To quote that famous theologian, Bob Dylan, <laughs> you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil and it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You know, the majority of the world, they think that Jesus is a joke. And they think that the resurrection was a hoax. Here's a quote by, the guy, by a guy by the name of A.J. Behrens. And he says this, and I think this pretty well sums up what the majority of the world thinks. And I quote, only those who are brainwashed and fools believe in the existence of God or in the existence of a God. And I would just like to pose this, and that is, what has that, how, how has that philosophy helped our country and our nation? A lot of people like to say that we are now more enlightened whatever that means. You talk to people and they'll say, well, I've got light. I have light in me. Well, have you been shot? Was it a through and through? You know, see all... What does that mean? I've got, I've got more light. I remember one time confronting a teacher, a grade school teacher of one of my sons that he was spouting this kind of stuff and we went up to talk to him and he wasn't too pleased. And I remember him saying, I've got more light than you will ever have. So you got a lot of Bud Light at home. That doesn't make any difference. <laughs> but a lot of people feel that way. A lot of people feel that we're foolish for believing in Jesus Christ. That it is some sort of a myth. Psalm 53.1 says this. This gives you a little bit of a contrast of what we've already seen from Barons. And this is what it says in Psalm 53.1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable iniquities. There is none who does good. So here you've got these two contrasts, right? You've got one over here that says, you're a fool to believe in Jesus Christ. You're a fool to believe in the resurrection, that it's all a hoax. It's all a, a fairy tale. And then you've got Psalm 53, 1 that says, it is a fool that says there is no God. And the majority of the world is living as though there is no God. 
In fact, to be honest with you, a lot of church people are living as though there is no God. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, kind of like government efficiency. They just don't mix, right? But there are a lot of church people who really don't believe in God. So who's right? Who's right? Is it intellectual suicide to believe in Jesus Christ? Did he even exist? Well, non-historical writers. I took a little different approach with this teaching. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to to get some people that were emphatically non-Christian. Historians. And I wanted to take a look at what they said. Did they say anything about Christians? Did they say anything about Jesus Christ? Did they say anything about resurrection? Did they say anything about crucifixion? The first one that I want to give you is a guy by the name of Tacitus. Cornelius Tacitus. He was and lived between 55 AD and 120. So he was a a Roman historian. Not a Christian historian, he was a Roman historian, and he lived through the reigns of probably a half a dozen different Roman emperors. And he had a famous book called Annals. And this is what he said regarding Christians and blaming Christians for the burning of Rome. And I think I've got it all up there. So follow along with me. He says, consequently... To get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations. Now, when you read that, you go, well, there you are. It was abominations. And I got to thinking about that. Do you know that most people in our world would call us an abomination? Do you know that most people in our world think that we're holding society back? That it's not moving forward because of our believing in the Bible? Do you know that they would think that taking communion, you know, eat of my body, drink of my blood, that that would be an abomination? So keep that in mind when you see that word. On a class that were hated for their abomination... They were called Christians by the populace. Now, this is not, this is a secular author. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurator, procurators, uh, Pontius Pilate. Okay, so you, you, you see the, the players? You see what's going on here being mentioned by someone who is not a Christian? And most mischievous superstition in reference to the resurrection thus checked for the moment because they had crucified the Christ though checked for a moment again it broke out not only in Judea that was the first source of this you know Jesus and the the news of the gospel broke out there in Judea it says then but even in Rome where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world, find their center and become popular. Kind of like L.A. (laughs) Or Hollywood. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Now, understand this. If you're not a Christian and you know you're going to suffer for it and maybe die for it, you're not going to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Right? Right? If you're a marginal believer, you don't really believe this, you're just tallying along or or coming along because mom and dad uh, were Christians or you're not not into it. And you know you're going to be facing death if you admit that you're a Christian. You're not going to say, yes, I'm a Christian. These Christians, they admitted it. They confessed, when they were cross-examined, they basically said, yes, I am a Christian. I am guilty of loving Jesus Christ. I am guilty of giving my life to him. I am guilty of believing in him as my Lord and my Savior. And then it goes on to say, then upon that information, 
an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Hatred against mankind? I don't hate mankind. Do any of you Christians hate mankind? You might get a little disappointed in them, a little disgusted with them from time to time, but you don't hate mankind. Isn't it funny when you don't agree with somebody, you're a hater? When did that happen? When did America turn into the place where you can't disagree with someone? But nowadays, if you disagree with somebody, you are a horrible human being. You're a bigot, you're a racist, you're a this, you're a that, you're a that. And it may not be true at all in your life. You just disagree with a point or a few points in somebody's life. But because you don't agree, now you're hated. Okay. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished. Or were nailed to crosses. Keep that in mind, this is not a Christian. They were nailed to crosses. Or were doomed to the flames and burnt. To serve as a nightly illumination when the daylight had expired. Now, you know what, know what that means? That these Christians, in a lot of cases, were dipped in tar. They were forced on posts that had been sharpened, forced on posts, and lit on fire as entertainment. For entertainment. Nero, of course, offered his gardens for the spectacle. And he was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer and stood aloft on the car or the cart of that chariot. Hence, even for criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion. For it was not, as it seemed, for the public good, but to the glut of one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. Ah, Christianity didn't exist. It was just made up. It's like people turning around and I trying to say now that the Holocaust didn't happen. That it didn't exist. We would like to forget those horrible atrocities inflicted upon man, wouldn't we? This was there, this was real. Now you might say, well, this report's not very flattering for Christianity. But that's the point. That's exactly the point that I'm trying to make. He was not a believer. But here's what it does prove. I want to give you several points of what this does prove. Number one, Christians were named after Jesus Christ. Jesus was put to death by Pontius Pilate. All right? His death ended the superstition for a while, but it broke out again, especially in Jerusalem, Judea. You guys might remember, upon his death, everybody freaked out, even the disciples. They were counting on him being king. They, he told them over and over and over and over and over again that it was going to happen. He told them that that's what he was there for, was to give his life for mankind, but they didn't get it. They were expecting another emperor, another king, another ruler who would overthrow Rome. And when he died, when they actually were able to kill him physically, they freaked. They were lost for a little while. Until three days later. And then he rose from the dead and it brought a whole new fire in to Christians' hearts. And it moved from just Jerusalem into Rome. And guys, think about it. We're sitting here today. We're sitting here today because of what that man did so long ago. And I know you all have better things to do. Let me change that. I know you all have other things that you could be doing. But we're here today because of what he did. Like I said, he carried that on into Rome. We also see here another fact that's indisputable, and that is that Nero, the emperor, blamed the Christians for the fire. 
Now, if the Christians weren't there, if they weren't real, if this hadn't happened, you couldn't blame them for the fire. These Christians were arrested after pleading guilty. I've already shared that with you. They were mocked and they were tortured, including being nailed to crosses. That's important. That's extremely important. Or burnt to death. Now, I want to give you another secular historian. One, I think that... It proves the point, but two, I hope, will kind of nail it down for you. This is another Jewish historian by the name of Josephus. He was born somewhere around 37 or 38, died somewhere around 97. He was born into a priestly family. He became a Pharisee at the age of 19. After surviving a battle with the Romans, he served Commander Vespian in, the, in Jerusalem. And then later, at the destruction of uh, Jerusalem, somewhere around AD 70, he moved to Rome, and so did Vespian, so he could end up being his right-hand man. Uh, Vespian became emperor, and uh, Josephus went along with him, followed along with him. He has a famous book called Antiquities, or Antiquities of the Jews. And here's what he says in his book. He says, at this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus. Some people still believe that it's just a wise man. His conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had disappeared, excuse me, that he had appeared to them three days after the crucifixion and that he was alive according to his, excuse me, and accordingly he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted many wonders. Now, what's my point in this? I want to be able to give you some indisputable facts from this, although this man was not a born-again believer, did not believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. Now, from these two accounts, guys, you cannot deny that Jesus was a real person. We like to just pretend something doesn't exist. It's kind of like us guys going to the doctor. We don't want to know until we just don't wake up some morning, right? We don't want to know what's, what's going on, so we just deny that anything's going on so we don't have to go to the doctor and afraid he might say something to us. Some people are that way about Jesus. Let's just pretend he doesn't exist because if we pretend he doesn't exist, we don't have to deal with him. We don't have to deal with what, how I spend my weekends or how I spend what I, what I do in my life. I don't have to be accountable for what I do, so I'll just pretend as though he's not there. The second point was as that he had many disciples from Jews and Gentiles and that Pilate had him crucified. There again, that is confirmed. The disciples reported that he had been raised from the dead and appeared to them for uh, three days later during the resurrection. And there's other accounts where it says he was on the face of the earth almost 40 days in the Bible. During this process, his half-brother, James, you kind of get the impression that he was kind of half in and half out. You know, if anybody knows you, it's your brother, right? Your brother or your sister, they know you. They know your imperfections. They know this. They know that. There was plenty of evidence for James to worship Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but he was his brother, and I get the impression he, he kind of wondered, but after the resurrection, guys, something happened. Something happened so remarkably that James became a, a sold-out believer in Jesus Christ. That's hard to do for a brother. Can you imagine any brother saying, I worship you? <laughs> we saw that with Joseph and his brothers. His brothers hated him, right? Because he was favored. All right, I'm going to move to more evidence. This is archaeological evidence. In 1968, there was a portion of Jerusalem that was being prepared for new apartment buildings. And while they were doing that, an ancient Jewish burial site was uncovered. It was located about one mile north of the old Damascus Gate. And the most important discovery in this site was the skeleton of a man named Yohanan. 
Yohanan ben Hagalgal, I think that's his name. Can you imagine that's name? Hey, I'm ben Hagalgal guy. <laughs> anyway, that was his name. We'll go by Yohanan. Now, they knew it was Yohanan because his name was written on the ossuary, which is, would be like a headstone for, for us. Now, I want you to compare what we know about Jesus Christ and what I'm about to tell you about Yohanan. He was the victim of crucifixion. Still piercing his feet was a large nail about seven inches long. That'd be about this long. About seven inches long that had been driven sideways through his heels and his bones. An examination disclosed the fact that nails had also been driven between the radius. We got a, a picture up here. The radius and the ulna. Now, Dr. Steve knows what I'm talking about here. The radius is on the inside, the ulna is on the outside, right? And the nail that had been driven was driven between the two of these down towards the joint in the wrist. Same kind of thing that we depict in Jesus. Unfortunately, sometimes you see the ones that are in his hands. I think that's an unfortunate uh, representation. The weight of the body would have slipped right through those. So they put them down here between the radius and the ulna. Now, what was interesting about this is that the bones had been uh, worn. They were, they were worn down. They were scratched and almost worn smooth. And here's why. Because when he was up like this, his chest would go down. They would, he would bend, they would bend the knees and they would be down like this. It would take a lot of the pressure off of them. But when you're like this, you can't breathe. Your, your, your chest muscles, they, they, they collapse and your chest collapse. So what they would do is they would push up on that nail in their feet. They would push up to try to be able to get a little bit of air. But they couldn't maintain it long. And they would have to go back down. So in the process of going up and down, the bones would be worn smooth. As was the case with Johanan. So, let me go on. Johanan's legs were, were broken. All pretty normal in a Roman crucifixion with the exception that Jesus' legs were not broken. In John 19, 31 through 32, it reads like this. Therefore, because it was preparation day and the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken. In other words, these guys are lasting too long. They're getting up and getting air, then they're going back down, and they're lasting too long. We got a celebration going on. We want them dead. So go along. The Roman soldiers would go along, break their legs, because then they couldn't push up anymore, and they would suffocate, and they would die. Now, I want you to think about this. Why would they not do it to Jesus? They wanted him to suffer. They wanted him to suffer a slow and painful death. Here's my last one as far as this goes. The Shroud of Turin. Many of you may have read something that said, oh, it's fake. I'd like to give you some things to think about. Some things to rethink. Whether you believe that it was the actual burial garment of Jesus or not, I want to, again, state some things that are indisputable. Both the man in the shroud and Jesus suffered a series of puncture wounds on the scalp. Now, you remember when they were mocking him and calling him king of kings, they put that crown of thorns on his head and pushed it down onto his head. That wasn't normal. That wasn't a normal part of crucifixion. He had a bruised face. The shroud also shows that this man did. A bruised face, and he had suffered 
a horrible lashing. Over 100 wounds from that beating have been counted on the shroud. Abrasions on the shoulders from a rough, heavy object and contusions on both knees. Luke chapter 23, verse 26. It reads like this. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian from Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Now that after is important. It can be taken a couple different ways. Some people say that that means that he had to carry the cross behind Jesus. That Jesus was out front. It also possibly and strongly means that Jesus tripped and fell. It was too much. He'd lost too much blood. They had beaten him so severely that he could not do it. This would account for the knees. So they got somebody else to bear his cross. If you look at John 19, verse 17. John 19, verse 17, it says... And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side. And Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote on a title, and he put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. He meant it as a mockery. Here's your king, look at him. He's humiliated. He's dead. But what he didn't realize is he was speaking the truth. He was speaking the truth. Strangely, on the shroud, both men avoided having their ankles broken. Jesus and the shroud guy. We'll call him that for now. They avoided having their ankles broken. That is extremely rare. That wasn't normal for a normal crucifixion. They both had post-mortem chest wounds from which blood and watery fluid flowed out of that wound. Both men were buried very quickly in fine linen and they were buried individually, not in a mass grave, but but, uh, buried individually. Even more interesting is the possibility that the image was caused by some sort of intense light or intense heat that emanated from this body while it was in a state of rigor mortis. In short, the converging scientific facts show that the body left the cloth by some as yet unknown means. They don't know how that image got on there. It's not paint. It can't be reproduced. They haven't figured out. They don't know. They have absolutely no idea how that image was transferred to the cloth. The shroud also contains no bodily decomposition. Couldn't find a trace. What this indicates is the body exited the cloth after a relatively short time. And according to scientific team, uh, uh, the scientific team, the pathologist that was there, it said the body probably was not unwrapped. The pathologist says the body was probably not unwrapped because of the many blood stains that were intact on the cloth, including the blood clots because the cloth if it had been pulled off of the body it would have disturbed those blood stains and they wouldn't have looked the same it wouldn't have been the same and lastly they have proven that the carbon dating that they used they did carbon dating and said no it's from the middle ages but they've proven that their carbon dating was inaccurate Let me give you a couple examples. They took, the people that said, I think your your findings are wrong, they took cloths from different dates made out of the same kind of linen. They took these cloths and they put the date on the cloth 
of when it was manufactured. And they had this laboratory that checked the one on the shroud. And they had them do the carbon dating. Carbon dating. The dates were off as much as several centuries. Now, in regard to the shroud itself. Now, these were three different samples, three different dates, and they got them wrong. But regarding the shroud itself, they didn't take the cloth from three different places. They took it from one corner known as the Reyes Corner. They took the sample, and they used that same sample each time, and that corner was the most contaminated section of the entire cloth. I wouldn't call that scientific. And there's been several other things where carbon dating cannot be trusted. I want to read this to you. Some of you are familiar with it. Some of you might not be. But let's, let's take a look at the biblical evidence now. I won't have you here much longer. It has been said of Jesus. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that are usually associated with greatness. And he had absolutely no credentials but himself. He was only 33. His friends ran away. One of them completely denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves, and while dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing. It's the only property that he had on earth. When he was dead... He was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone. And today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all of the navies that have ever sailed, all of the parliaments that have ever sat, all of the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as, pow as powerfully as this one solitary man. Amen. Amen. People are scared to death to believe in Jesus. They are afraid of him. Let me give you a couple things here. Luke 9, 18. Luke 9, 18. And when he was alone praying, it happened that his disciples joined him. And he said to them, who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and they said, well, John the Baptist. Some people say, Elijah. Elijah. And others say that you're one of the old prophets that have risen again. Here's the most important question. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? Isn't that the real question? It's not who do they say I am. It's who do you say he is? It doesn't matter what mom said he was or grandma or grandpa or the world or any president or any government. Who do you say that he is? And I want you to notice something. Peter answered and he said, you are the Christ of God. Some people spend their entire life in church and never get this. What, is, what, do you, what do you mean, pastor? There's one thing to be religious. 
You can be religious your whole life, whole life and not be set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's one thing to maybe believe that he was a historic figure. But unless I let him into my heart, unless I come to this revelation of who he is, it doesn't change me one bit. Jesus changed the world. He was full of love and kindness and forgiveness and those who believed in him found life and freedom. He healed the sick and the lame. He gave sight to the blind and he fed the poor and the hungry. He never taught anarchy or rebellion and yet governments and religious leaders were afraid of him enough that they wanted to kill him. On, uh, excuse me, on Passover, Pontius Pilate said that he would pardon one of the criminals, which was the custom. He had the right to pardon one of the criminals. And it came down to Jesus and a murderer by the name of Barabbas. And the crowd called out for... Can you imagine that, guys? Barabbas, 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 Barabbas. A known murderer when Jesus had done nothing except try to show people compassion and love. And they were afraid of him because they, violence and, and ego and everything else meant more to those in power than what Jesus was teaching. Humility. He did more in three short years than all the religious leaders ahead of him. Because they got in the flesh and it became a money thing. That's why he overthrew the, the table for the money changers. It made him sick. Religion had become something that you bought and you sold. And he came telling people, I love you. And I've forgiven you. You have an opportunity to live forever. You can exchange that old life for a new one. And it scared people to death. Remember what George Martin had said? The greatest fools are oftentimes more clever than the men who laugh at them. It's not Jesus that was the fool. It's not those who believe in him as the Messiah. But perhaps it's time to rethink your position on who Jesus is. I beg you to rethink your position on who you think Jesus is. It's a matter of life and death. And I can promise you this. From many years of walking with the Lord, he won't hurt you. So many people are so afraid that if they give their life to him, it's, it's, not, it's not going to be good or he's going to do something evil or weird. Guys, he can't. That's not, his, that's not his character. That's not who he is. I'll stand with Brother Andrew who said, I'm a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you?